Hello. We are going live, and we're on a, a, a on a series called "Every Hateful Bird," and we're talking about how the bird and different trees in the Bible they all signify the female or feminine. Uh, the uh, it's a you know they're not necessarily fem, uh, feminine nouns, but they are. But the uh, the the relationship that is between the bird, the tree, and the trees, these are God's symbols showing us uh, the uh, rule of femininity, the, the feminine goddess worship, and how it infiltrates into his plan and how it uh, in, and in his, into his people and how we are captivated by the the uh, the seduction of the feminine goddess, and it says in Revelation we're going to start there because you, because Babylon is all about goddess worship. It's all about the uh, bringing people into uh, matriarchal, trying to get them to be uh, be feminine or demasculated, and trying to. Uh, and uh, disempower them because the power of God is masculine. The power of the Holy Spirit working in individual, it, he is a masculine spirit. And when you have the Holy Spirit uh, dwelling in you, you're going to work and operate in power, sometimes a militant power because we are in authoritative power because the, the, the kingdom of God supersedes all other kingdom and it works and operates in the power of God. And his power worketh in human vessels, male or female, because the Bible says that in the kingdom of God, there is no male or female. There is no bond or free. There is no there is no Jew or Gentile because they, the the natural person does not exist exist any longer in the kingdom of God. You are becoming renewed. You're becoming spiritually minded. You're becoming a a, a new man, which is born of God, which is a resurrected inside human vessels. But these are the spirit man that is being resurrected. It's the, the new man inside of us that is in operation. And this is what is in connection with the kingdom of God, because God uh, receives sons and it, and so sons, it, it means uh, family or his uh, posterity, his, his, he is uh, his inheritor. So there is no gender when it comes to the spirit realm, but don't, yeah, but there is gender in the realm of the physical. We must stay within our roles. We must stay within our gender, our, our gender, uh, specificity or our, 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 our genders, because God gave us roles within the in in the uh, physical that we must w learn to uh, operate in, but in the spirit realm, it we are under a king that is masculine, and he and we become sons of God in the spirit realm. We become inheritors. So there is uh, even. A, as a female, we when I we will inherit the land. There, it's because His Spirit lives in me, and I will inherit the land as a son. I will be considered a a a a, a offspring, a son of God. The Bible says that we are we are we are. God has given us the power to become sons of God. So through one son's becomes many sons. So it has nothing to do with our physical condition. It has to do with that the Holy Spirit resides in you, that is transforming you and making you into a son of God. So anyways, but we want, but what the enemy does, what Satan does, he wants to make everyone into, uh, into a feminine characteristic or a character of 
of the opposite of what God has created for humanity. He created us to be male and female, and we are to be united in one house uh, ruled by the power and the authority of God and as our, as as he is our king, as he is our Lord, as he is our master, as he is our father, he is the father of spirits. So we are, we are under his rulership and as, as a house or as the a female counterpart to receive, receive his spirit, to receive his glory, his abode and, and to reflect his image and his likeness. But in that, he re reflected in the household of God, male and female. Is that correct? So anyways, it is all about uh, coming under his rulership. But Satan wants us to come under the rulership of the feminist goddess or he wants to uh, he wants to distort and pervert and corrupt those things that which God has had put in as a divine order. So his way is a crooked path, or it's the opposite of what God has created. When we do an act in the opposite of how God designed the order, um, the, the Bible says that every man head is Christ, and then the woman is under the man, and we reflect the glory of the man. And when those things are in proper order, we're going to have we're not going to have uh, uh, we're going to have uh, we're going to have harmony. We're going to have peace. We're going to have we're going to have the blessings of God. But when we're out of order, then there's chaos, and there is uh, there is uh, there is dissension and there's uh, there is uh, there's there's problems within the satanic kingdom there's curses and and we become we become uh uh infected by the the powers of darkness which will will distort and pervert and 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 cause us to fall into uh patterns that are 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 contradictory to the word of God. So the God, uh, so the, the Holy spirit brings order. Satan's kingdom brings disorder or disharmony, disunity. He brings strife and division. Do you see what I mean? He brings, he, he brings uh, the opposite. And when we are worshiping outside of God's divine way, and his and his plan when we're worshiping idols when we're and when we're seeking after worldly pleasures when we're when we're putting our affections towards the world and the things of the world and the traditions of the world and then we're and we're bowing to those things then what we become is godless and we become uh, uh, instruments and agents for the powers of darkness to be able to infiltrate and distort and pervert our our very being because the bible says he has not given us the spirit of fear but of power love and a sound mind so our the soundness or the peacefulness of god or the or the gentleness or goodness of god becomes uh, be, becomes abated and our life becomes <laughs> Uh, becomes very uh, disrupt. Do you see what the peace is gone? The goodness of God, the godliness is gone when we're not working and operating in the blessings of God. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So this is why it's so important that we understand who we worship and what we worship and what we uh, we contribute our uh, our our within our lifestyle. You know, within our life in. Uh, and in our homes and our, our lifestyles must conduct and be and be uh, an uh, an object of divine worship, which is to the Father, and that we're to eliminate all uh, all the worldly worship because everything in the world worships the goddess or or Babylon. Babylon is inundated with goddess worship, and Satan infiltrates these things in our lives through our interaction with Babylon or with the world. It's very hard for us to separate because our flesh is enticed and our flesh draws to the things of the world. And our and Satan uses our emotions and our feelings and, and our condition living in the world to seduce us into worshiping the things of the world. 
worshiping the creation rather than the creator. So this is where we, this is why uh, we start focusing on the things of this life and not focusing on the things that, uh, that are not of this life, the things that are not seen. These are the things that we are to focus on because we're, we're focusing on a kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God <laughs> that is rule in power and authority and it's masculine and it is, and it is, uh, but it is order is proper love. It's proper respect It's proper. It's, it's, it's got the, the, all the conditions that we long for, right? If we follow the principles of God, right? Because if we're looking for love, if we're looking for acceptance, if we're looking for any kind of affirmation or to be affirmed, those things are in the kingdom of God. Everything outside of the kingdom of God is full of hatred, rejection, and 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 evil. Do you see the 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 men's heart become very wicked and evil? and self-centered and in God's kingdom it's it's uh unselfish love it's uh it's it's love uh it's compassion and it's and it is and it is thinking of others other than other uh, than the, than yourself and focusing our lives on on those things that, that uh please him and allow him to work uh, in our lives as he wished, let the fruits of the spirit develop within us, right? Yeah. That, and the fruits of the spirit is not for us to receive, but it is to be able to give to others, right? So when we're working in the kingdom of God, we're going to see the blessings of God and we're going to see his, uh, his, uh, his principles and his blessings work within our families. And that's really the, that's the, really the, you know, what we want in life. That's, that's the goal, right? Is to see God's blessings and not his, and not the curses. We want to see the order. We want to have peace where there is no peace. This is why the Bible says that the, the peace that Yeshua Jesus gives us is not the peace that the world gives us. It's it, it supersedes or it superimposes uh, the peace that we can ever try to obtain here in this life. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to we're going to talk about this uh, about Jonah. And last time I spoke, and actually it was forty days. God gave them 40 days. I said three days or some, uh, I, I guess I was listening to a teaching and that, and it just sounded like three days, but actually it was 40 days that he, he said that judgment would come on, uh, come on Nineveh, right? 40 days. And we see in Luke 11 that Jesus said that there would be no sign given but the sign of Jonah. And we understand that Jonah means dove, right? Which is the, the resurrected power of the Holy Spirit. You know, the, uh, the dove, the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus uh, like unto a dove, right? Not a literal dove, but a dove. It was peace. It was love. It was the full of the fruits of the spirit. It was, it was the, the acceptance of heaven, right? The acceptance because he was now becoming a manifest son of God. He was now being endowed with the power on high and he was full of the Holy spirit. And he moved about amongst the people through the uh, through his, uh, through love and through compassion and desiring for them to come and to understand where they were at and where and what he was going to do for them to bring them back into reconciliation with the father see they we uh, we don't understand that there was a breakage there was a breakage when Adam fell there was a gap a gap that separated uh, mankind from Father God and Jesus through him he br he brought that reconciliation he brought the uh, he brought both heaven and earth together correct he brought the relationship through him 
we are reconciled with the Father through his blood. So when we come into Jesus, when we come into the Messiah, the Father sees the blood. He sees He sees Christ. He sees the, 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 the begotten Son of the Father that covers us. And we are we are we are now uh, becoming sons, being conformed to His image, but we are being connected with the Son of God. But what Satan wants to do, he wants to disconnect us with the true Son of God and cause us to worship the things of the earth and put our dependency on the things of the earth so that we will never reflect the image of the Son of God, that we never come into this communion. That he that has been given by his blood and his body, that when and that is where our reconciliation is correct. That when when the Father sees the Son, the begotten Son, and the and now we are in, we're shielded or we're into Christ. We are covered right but by the Lamb's blood, just like it is the Passover. The death angel must pass over. The judgment of God must pass over those who are in the Lamb of God, right? Because the Lamb blood protects, it acts as a shield, as a covering for those who put their trust in God. He is our high tower our and our deliverer, and he is the one that shields us from the powers of darkness. So when we're, when we're thinking about this, we're thinking about, in accordance to the spirit realm, not in so much in accordance to the physical, because we're going to get blows in the physical. Satan works and and his agents works in and operate in the physical realm to try to destroy our belief and our trust in God. Does he not? And the and the perfect work that Yeshua Jesus did on the cross, where we we're more. We are more conscientious about the things of the earth. We're more conscientious about uh, our our circumstances than we are on him. And so what he does is he attacks in the physical to uh, to uh, to get try to remove us from our position in Christ. We have a place in him. But but 40 days he God called Jonah uh, to preach to Nineveh, and he and and Jonah went into the city and said, "In forty days, if you do not turn from your wicked ways, he was going to destroy that city." And they uh, put on sackcloth and ashes, and they repented because they were under the powers of 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 the Babylonian worship because Nimrod and Samaris, Samaris, his wife. And Talmuz and all of that mythology was inundated in their culture, right? Was inundated in their culture and they worship the things of the earth. And when you start worshiping up the things of the earth, you're going to start having, uh, you're going to ha- start having characteristics of the idols that you worship. You become you become the same image of the idols you worship, right? If you're if you're full of lust, if you're full of of these earthly desires and lust, that lust will overtake you, and the, and you will start to reflect the appearance of that which you have bowed yourself to, right? Because all we are is a reflection of of the God we worship, right? We are a reflection. So the things that we put in front of us, the things that we we give adoration, we give time, we give reverence to, they become they become a, a part of us. We become attached to these things, and we become a reflection of that. This is why. Uh, most people who, uh, you know, love the celebrities and their idols. And if they have a tattoo, they, they get a tattoo. If they wear their hairstyle one way, they will wear their hairstyle the other, the same way they they start to, uh, re, uh, to take on the same characteristics and the image of that, which they worship. And they start to mimic or, 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 or mimic what they, what they have received in their tabernacles. We are tabernacles of the living God. We are temples. And if you 
you, it, we are made to reflect the God we worship. If you worship Satan, if you worship the goddess, if you worship the earth, your countenance is going to witness against you, right? That's what scripture says. Your countenance will witness against, against you to those things that you worship. This is why we must walk, work hard to detach ourselves from the earth so that we can reflect the goodness and the holiness and, and the purity of God. His glory is holy. And we are not to put anything in our temples or put inward or outward that reflect anything of the earth, right? So we are to reflect the image of God. We're supposed to be reflecting the image of the heavenly not the image of the earthly. And sometimes we get, we get, because those are the things that we see. Those are the things that seem so real to us. So we end up worshiping in the things that are there, that, that we, they're more tangible to us. That seems so much more real, but these things, the Bible says they will perish, but we are to get, our, we are to gaze our eyes on the things of the heavens and we are to reflect our tabernacles as that of the heavenly temple and we are to be purified as fine gold, right? Because the heavenly streets of, of Jerusalem is paved with fine gold, right? Transparent gold. And with no, with no, uh, with no, uh, you know, with no impurities of all, it, it's pure gold that we can say it and it's transparent. So we, we should be transparent people too. We shouldn't have no hidden hidden things within us, we should be as transparent gold reflecting the image of, of, of our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Messiah, and what he has desires are for us each and every day. But, you know, the sign of Joseph, it was 40 days. So 40 days in scripture means new beginnings or transition, means renewal or testing and judgment. So God gave them space to repent for 40 days and the sign of Jonah was this uh, this resurrection power. He was the dove. He was, came to offer peace, reconciliation. He acted in the, the in the in, as a Mashiach or the Melchizedek order to bring in reconciliation for the people on for God's behalf. And so God would not act in His justice, but He would act in His mercy. And so because they took key to the warning God, uh, to the people and, and cried out unto God for mercy, understanding that the God of heaven is the ultimate God. He is the God of justice and he will and he will uh, bring his just upon, justice upon the land that has turned what the Bible says they have turned and worshiped idols, right? Mm -hmm. that have turned their back against him and worship the earth. It is the opposite. That's what it means. The opposite of, of God's divine order. So anyways, he so we're going to look at this. So Jonah was the dove, but Nineveh, which means uh, the uh, the king of Num Nimus, which means king of Nimrod that ruled there, that brought these people un under bondage to rebellion. Remember, I'm talking about rebellion and witchcraft. Rebellion and witchcraft. And because of their rebellion, the Bible says that witchcraft is a, is a, is is a work or is a work of the flesh so when we work in the flesh or the power of the flesh then and in rebellion which is ma uh, manipulation intimidation and domination we are working in the power of the satanic kingdom right we're working under the, the 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 control because yeshua jesus and his kingdom he says uh, he says that he brought us peace. He get, he gives us a peace offering, right? He with his blood and body, he offers a peace offering. He the Bible says, "I did not come to condemn the world, but through me that you can be saved." So he's not condemning us. He's bringing us, trying to bring us out, out of the slavery, out of the bondages 
of, of Babylon, which what Babylon does is it operates and works in the power of witchcraft and sorcery and and revolts against the order of God. So there's rebellion at its core, right? And, yeah. he, and what Satan does is he wants to infiltrate or he wants to come, ag uh, come against the powers of God and to deconstruct, right? Or to, or to uh, come into and compromise the kingdom of God. So it does not progress in the power of God. Once, once you have been breached, once you've been, once you compromise, once you have allowed Babylon to come in, guess what? Your your anointing is is weakened, right? It's weakened, and the power of God that worketh and operating in you is no longer in in power. It's not it's not at its capacity, right? The power of God. It's not like He's left you. Right. But it means that the power of God has not been it's not the strength, the horsepower of, of the operation of God's power. You know, the more you have the power of the spirit abiding you, of you, more that you surrender your life, more that you allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you, the more power you have to overcome. Right. The more power you have to exercise your faith, more power you have to see the demonstrated power of his of his anointing working and operating in your life. But once we're weakened by the things of the world, once we're weakened by, by the pleasures and the wants of this world or the, or just the, the necessities of the world, right? We get weakened just by the, just the, just the natural necessities of life. We get burned down, right? And we lose we we sense we lose our, our 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 power, and we have to go and get revved up again. We have to we have to stoke the fire. We have to uh, we have to get in a, a a a solitude place with God where we can burn, and He can inflame us again, so that the flesh and the things that we allow, because sometimes we get into situations. And we're around uh, rebellious and wicked people that constantly speak speak against the things of God. We're constantly being programmed. We're constantly around people that speak filthy and words all the time. That that's intentional. They want to. They want to weaken you. They want to weaken you in the in the power of God. It's it's all intentional because once you you weaken the flesh, then the spirit can come alive, and God can work in the spirit man to make it alive again, right? To make it powerful, to make it strong. <laughs> this is why uh, infeminacy. The word in uh, in Greek, infeminacy, means uh, means uh, a, a means small. You have a small spirit or a weak spirit, a little spirit, right? It just means that you're weak and you and and and, and you're small, and it does. And so you don't have the strength or the power to be able to come against the powers of darkness because you're small. You have not built up that inner man. You have not strengthened the inner man. You're, it's not filled up to be able to resist the things of darkness. Sometimes it takes time, but it says in Psalms 9, it says the Lord also will be the refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in the time of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, O Lord, has not forsaken them that seek thee. Sing praises to the Lord, which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. When he maketh inquisitions for his blood, he remembereth them. He forgot Forgetteth not the cries of the humble. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble, which I suffer of thee, that hate me, that is come against me, that they lifteth me up from the gates of death, that I may show forth all the praises in the gates of the daughters of Zion. I will rejoice in thy salvation. Uh, and says, I think I wrote this one, but it, I will read it anyways, that I may show forth all the praises in the gates of the daughters and I'll rejoice in thy salvation. 
uh, and the heathens are sucked down in the pit that they may. Okay, this is what I want to read. The heathens are sucked down in the pit that they may in the net, in the snare, in the entrapments, the binding and the yokes that uh, that uh, Babylon, the tentacles of Babylon, and her and what she, and what she's involved there. The, so the heathens or the heathenistic ways of life are are sunk down in a pit they are brought low and they are made and they are captured or captivated right in a snare or in a net which they hid in their own foot taking Where, wherever you lead wherever your foot may trod right wherever you know the bible says the you know those who are uh, quick or swift to do evil their foot are, are always it, you know, against or going after evil things the, in Proverbs 6, I believe it is. And it says, the Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is a snare in the works of his hands. Selah. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the heathens be judged in thy sight. But put thy fear, O Lord, that the nations may know them to be to be but men. Hallelujah. So anyways, we, they, there is a snare that is that is in Babylon. And if we don't avoid those snares, those entrapments, then we're going to be captured, right? Caught up. And a lot of times we we don't really we don't really uh we don't really see those entrapments until we're to, until they come upon us, right? We don't always know what's wrong until we get involved in it. Once we get involved in it, once we partake of it, once we see it, then it be then it becomes a snare unto us, right? We we don't see the harm because most of the time the things that are in Babylon, they look innocent, they look pure, they don't they don't look harmful at all, they don't look wicked because Satan comes as an angel of light. He knows if he comes in a wicked way right? He's in, and in a scary way or a fearful way. If he, if we saw the end of, of, of what we're, you know, allowing ourselves to get involved in, then we would never go that direction. Right. But since we do not always see the end to the path that, and the directions that we go, they end up becoming a snare unto us, right? This is why the Bible says that the word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. In Proverbs 6, it says, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven, an abomination unto him. A proud look, a lion tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises a wicked imagination and feet that is shift to running into mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies and that soweth discord this amongst the brethren. So our feet, if, the, if our feet are, are uh, you know, going about to doing mischief and that word to do bad or to do evil or, uh, or adversity, wrong, then we are going, we're going to be caught in a snare, right? The lust, the entanglements of the flesh, right? So anyways, when we look at Jonah, we look that in Luke, let's go there, Luke 11. Because a lot that we're, uh, we're seeing in scripture and what we see throughout the scripture is this dichotomy between the masculine worship and the matriarchal worship, right? Mm -hmm. These diametrically oppose each other. And these two are the two kingdoms that are working and vying for our attention, right? Right. That is desiring, uh, desiring us out. And, and so God is desiring for us to come under his covering. But Satan also is desiring for us to come under his covering. Right. Yeah. And he has advantage because guess what? We he works and operates in the flesh. And when we're uh, we're mo mostly uh, 
we're mostly in tuned with the things of the flesh, right? Mm -hmm. So if our minds and our emotions and our feelings and desires are are in the in the carnality or in the physical, and those things are prevalent, then those are the things that we're going to want to go after, right? Mm -hmm. The things that are God, they are unseen. The things that are they are eternal. This is why the Bible says that we are to take hold of eternal life. Because these things are the things that are, they're the ones that are, uh, you know, these things are the things that, that are, we cannot see, but these are the things that are eternal. They're lasting. These are the things that are not going to perish. These things, the eternal things are the, what are the, is the end result, right? We may not right. see it, but th it's the things of the eternal life, the things of the spirit life. Those are the things that we're trying to get to because those are the things that will never perish, never fade away. These are the things that will always be, will always be for, for, for all eternity, right? Mm -hmm. So, but what Satan does is keep us focused on the natural and on, and on the here and now and, and, and what, and the deficiencies of inside of us so that we focus on earthly things, which the <laughs> earthly things are going to perish, right? right? The things that you see, the Bible says, these things are temporal and they're good and they will, will fade away. So we've got to be eternally minded, take hold of eternal life. We've got to take hold of that life to come, right? Mm -hmm. The, the life to come, the alarm. And, and and take hold of that world because it's it's an everlasting world right that will never die and will never end mm -hmm. but there is a place that would also that is eternal that will never end and that is hell itself yeah. and we, if we don't take hold of Jesus and and his eternal offering and what he provides for us we're going to end up in a eternal damnation instead of eternal life right right and it says in uh luke uh 11 it says in it's uh let's 11 29 let's just go up a little bit It says in the ninth verse, and I say unto you, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be open unto you. For everyone that asks receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. To him that knocketh it shall be open. If a son shall ask bread of, of you that is father, will he give him a stone <laughs> or his or a fish or a serpent? Will he will he for a fish give a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? See, these he's he's giving you that contrast because what Satan offers, he he you know even at this he he offers uh, the earthly things. You know he uh, you know he uh, he offers earthly things that have a have a deadly end, a serpent, a snake, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, if the but it's spiritual, it's spiritual, and, and it it's spiritualism. It's a it has a power. It has an effect. It has a cause and effect. You go into your uh, your secret place. The, you know, talking about sorcerers and witchcraft, or those big people who work in the dark arts. They go into their secret place, right, and they're activating the spirit realm they're they're getting uh they're getting connected with the 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 spirit realm this uh, the uh, the uh the uh power that satan provides for them right it, it the new age spiritualism mysticism whatever you want to call it right it's outside of christ and you're tapping into those dark arts you're top, tapping in those things but and and you're seeing you're seeing the effects you're seeing the results you're seeing the the power that you are demonstrating you are putting forth and you do not see the the detrimental effects in, that is in your own life until you try to get out of it then you're going to see that satan is going to turn on you like a scorpion like a a, a poisonous 
a scorpion, a poisonous viper, a poisonous, right, mm -hmm. serpent. Because he can only offer you death. You may get some kind of uh, an effect or feel empowered by it. You may feel like you are, uh, you're conquering or elevating. You're getting positions. You're getting some fleshly carnal needs met. But the end result is always death. Yeah. And that's why you must get out of it. But, but like Jesus says, I'm not denying. I'm not denying that there uh, that there is there is not power that we can we you know that we can can tap into we can tap into power he's not denying that there's power that we can tap into outside of him right he's not denying that there is there is darkness that surrounds us that there's people <laughs> and practitioners that work in these arts that don't have power they do have power right there is power in the realm of the satanic kingdom, but Yeshua defeated all that. Jesus defeated all that. There is, there are limited power and that power will end up killing you, right? Destroying you and destroying your family and destroying everything around you. This is why he says that the father will not give you that kind of power. The fa father is not going to give you witchcraft power sorcery domination he's not going to give you those abilities that work in the carnality that work in the flesh but he's yeah. going to give you and endow you with the power on high and he will give you the holy spirit because the holy spirit is more than just power which the kingdom of god is power but it is all to get also to give you the characteristics of god the attributes of god the nature of god it's changing you and transforming you, changing your direction from from death unto life. Right? Mm -hmm. It's changing. So the power of God, uh, the Spirit, is more than just seeing things get done in your life. The Holy Spirit is more than that. It is to bring you into the newness of life, the new beginning. This is why forty days. If you don't come into this renewal. This transitioning, going through the testings and overcoming and being transformed, you're going to receive the judgment of God, right? Because the Holy Spirit, which represents the dove, is offering you peace, right? He's offering you that peace offering, which is the reconciliation through the Messiah, Yeshua, is Jesus' blood, to transform your life. And to, not only will it transform your life, it will also per, you get to be partakers of the divine nature, which is in Christ and his divine power that transforms you and renews you. And it also changes your environment, changes your circumstances. It changes you. We can see and demonstrate the power of God because the spirit worketh and operate in you. But he's not going to give you power for selfish needs, for selfish ambition, right? right? He's going to give you the power to demonstrate the glory to always reflect him, not yourself. Mm -hmm. So this is why the Holy Spirit coming as a, a, in the fruits of the Spirit, we must we must have the fruits before we can we can demonstrate his power. They, 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 the, every gift comes with a fruit that is attached to it. Right. Yeah. We have to be, we have to have the fruit of that gift before we can operate in that gift. And so this is why things don't always happen. And so anyways, let me go down a little bit more. And, and God, it says, talking about the sign of Jonah and it says, and then the people were gathered thick together and he began. And this is the evil generation that seek a sign and there's no sign be given, but the sign of Jonah, which is the resurrected power of God to renew and transform your life, to change you, to resurrect you from a carnal man to a spiritual man, right? to be able to work and operate in the realm of the eternal life, right? But 
what Satan does, the sign, the sign is given. There is no other sign but the sign of Jonah. The, the people should take not look at the signs of the skies like they are right now. They're looking for the signs of the sky of the appearing of, of Jesus coming back at his second coming. And they're looking at the signs of the heaven, which the Bible says they're going to be signs and wonders in the heaven. The moon is going to turn dark like blood you know, red as blood. And there's going to be, there are going to be signs, but those are not the signs that we're, we're needing to, to identify that the kingdom of God is within. But the sign that we're looking for is the sign of the Holy Spirit, right? The sign of the dove, the dove, right? The yeah. dove that is ascending and descending off our life, the life that is peace. The Bible says that what were we to go into every city and preach the gospel? And if they receive you, right, leave your peace with them, he says. But if they do not receive you, if they do not receive the, the, the sign of that resurrection power, right? He said, what do you do? You dust your feet off and leave them unto the judgment of God, right? You are to dust your feet, leave that place, dust your feet. You're dusting the the ashes. You're dusting the place. What are we? We're all but ashes. We're all was form of the dust. And the and the Bible says it will be more tolerable for the uh, the cities of Sodom than for that city that has rejected the gift of God, which is the Holy Spirit, right? And the res and the resurrection power to become an eternal life-giving source in this world that is what the the sign of jonah is is to be able to work and operate in the power of god and come in in the in to, to city to city and offer the peace of god this is why the bible says that we're that we are our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace right we are to our feet wherever it tries should be to make reconciliation for the people to have compassion. This is one thing about Jonah. He did not have the compassion. He saw, he, you know, he was more affected by the, uh, the, the outcomes of sin, right? What right. sin produced in that city and how the people acted and behaved. And, and, and he was, you know, appalled by those things instead of being, uh, being compassionate, right, and, and and seeing that if you know if these people were, do not repent, that fiery judgment of God was going to come upon that city, and there would be no hope for them. This is why, in the at the end of that, God said they don't even know that they they're doing wrong. They're just following their own instincts. Satan has made them a a beast nature. Basically, they have just fallen. They're a base beastly nature. And they're just falling after what has been taught to them. And they don't know what's right or wrong. They don't know what their right hand to their left hand. They're confused, right? And this is what witchcraft does. Witchcraft is, is exactly what that is. Brings confusion. And I'm, I did a little bit of research on uh on witchcraft with the origin of witchcraft uh, of witchcraft where where do we get that word where is it linked to and it says it is it, it says in 15 the 1540 probably from an old english wise a wise w-i-c-e applied generally or vaguely to various tree various trees right having uh that are pliable pliant branches you know what are they they're kind of uh you know fruit bearing trees uh the you know drapey trees uh, flowery trees you know those ones that kind of hang low the branches hang low and uh, and it and it comes so they're pliable branches and for from the wiccan which means to bend to bend the truth or to bend the uh, the uh, the uh, the things that seem pure, the things that seem innocent, the things that are seem, uh, you know, seem 
uh, that are, you know, that are, that are not evil at all. They, or that just seems right, right. Enjoyable. They have good and bad mixed into them. Like we can take Easter, we can take Christmas. These things have some, they have some good to them in retrospect to the fact that family get togethers, right? Family, uh, they come together and they usually, uh, but they, you know, they join uh, in in fellowship and communion and love. There's always uh, there's always uh, good memories, traditions that are surrounded by these holidays, right? So people come together in a joyous feast or they're banqueting. Do you see what I mean? There's a there's a there's a lot of fun that that take place. There's a lot of decoration. There's a lot of preparation. There's just a lot that are involved. There's a lot of gift giving. So there is a sense of of goodness. Even the poor is fed at these during these times. People they go about, you know, and feeding the homeless at these times of years, right? And they and they give. There's a lot of giving there. They give presents, they give uh in contributions to charities. There seems to be a lot of goods that surrounds these holidays. Yeah. So what seems good is actually evil mm -hmm. because the root of it is evil. Do you see what I mean? It's what you worship. It's not like that God say not to be benevolent, not to be giving, not to, you know, to come together. He wants us to come together as a family and set up good traditions, but not surrounded by certain holidays, right? Wow. Not by certain worldly traditions. That root is in paganism that, and their decorations and their art uh, and their artifacts and their uh, trinkets and all the things that uh, that are surrounded the decorations they all have to do with goddess worship or sex worship they because everything that has to do with satan is uh, is surrounded by the worship of sex so witchcraft it means to bend And it also comes from to bend or to wind. So it's a it's entrapments. It's a snare. Hazel used for any bush of the pine family. Hazel, the North American bush from which a soothing lotion is made, was called uh, from the 1670s. This is the source of ver uh, verb which which is dousing a dousing. <laughs> So you are dousing or inundated by the by the pleasures that surround and the goodness that surround these these holidays, these American holidays, which are rooted in uh, in the fertility worship, right? Sex worship, and they will they will transform your life. They get you off the wrong, uh, they get you off the right path. They, they set your feet on the wrong path yeah. because now your heart is, is, is now affected by it. Right. Mm -hmm. You, now these become precious idols. They become idols that are very hard to detach, hard to separate. You don't see the evil. You, you become one or united, or, uh, you have this affection that's not, easily broken because what you what you gain from participating in these holidays participating in certain festivals participating in certain uh, uh worldly things right they don't they don't see the harm this is what we are doing uh they're eating of the tree of good and evil right the good and evil because it has a good side and a bad side but either way it will lead you to damnation and it does not lead you to the tree of life it does not give you the the uh the the everlasting joy right. it doesn't give you the everlasting life it doesn't it doesn't it is temporal it's a temporal satisfaction it's it's at the moment but it's not lasting and you then you walk away with turmoil 
and with problems, right? Confusion. You walk away with with uh, curses upon your life and things that um, that you, you things are happening in your life thinking, uh, where do these things come in? Because they're an open door to the demonic, right? You, When you participate in certain things in life, you're going to receive the, 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 uh, the, the demons legally. They, that's what they are. They legally have grounds to your life when you mess with the things that God tells you not to mess with, right? They have you, this is what, uh, I like Stephen Darby says, you do not mess with Satan's stuff. If you mess with state Satan stuff, they legally have grounds to bring curses and chaos to your life, right? They they can bind you. So we have to learn what belongs to Satan and what belongs to God. And we are to avoid those things that are that that are belong to him. So witchcraft is more than just uh someone uh pronouncing a curse on you or going and standing between in a um you know in a uh, in a pentagram and and drinking blood, right? There, we, there's the work and operation of sorcery and witchcraft that is deceiving people and bending you away from the crook. It's called the crooked path. The, it's a it's a bit of truth, right? It's a, it's it's a variation from the God of truth and the, what the Bible has said was truth, right? Right. It it's it is leading you in that crooked path. It's not you're not being you're not on the straight and narrow anymore so it if you were on the straight and narrow, it it keeps deviating you what further and further away from the purpose plan and destiny of god and the kingdom of god worshiping something else than than uh, what is permitted and that is god god the father son and the holy spirit these are the three that bear witness in heaven and those three are the ones that we are to worship and give our adoration and praise to not to anything of the earth, right? We are not to join ourselves with celebrations that are that are going to deter us away from the truth of God's word mm -hmm. and through the power of God's word. This is disempowering God's people. Is our participation in the things that belong to Satan? They bend us. And so you might have, you know, because, you know, Satan gets power through perversion. You know, witches get power through perversion. The more perverse you are, the more uh, satanic power you get. Right. And and the one goal of, of witchcraft is to deviate the believer off the straight and narrow course of life. Right. Mm -hmm away from the father, away from the son, away from the spirit, away from the kingdom of God, away, mm -hmm. away from the truth of God's word. That is what witchcraft does. And so, uh, so it, it, it came, it, it's associated with, uh, with trees, right? It's associated with trees in which I said last time, the birds lodge in trees, right? Mm -hmm. The birds lodge in trees. So they, they're kind of one and the same. This is why you see the goddess wor worship, Lilith. You see that all through the Bible in darkness, you know, or night. Lilith, which means the, uh, the twisting, the twisting of light and dark. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's bending, bending. And she has a... And uh, those who represent represent Lilith in mythology, they have an owl, an owl that uh, that uh, that signifies. You know, I taught on that uh, on Athena last time. That you know, she she had, uh, was associated with a bird, right? So it's an owl, or the wise, or wisdom, or war, a war god goddess. You know? mm -hmm. And it says in, so witch hazel has a long history and has been used by people for century, widely known for its medicinal and cosmetic use. So the cosmetics, which uh, cosmetic 
and and those things that are of the earth and satan uses the things of the earth to distort our image right distort our image distort us and and bring us uh, into another life right and we we all get caught up in that we all get caught up in 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 you know in the what in in the you know in our youth or it's if it's a, you know i did images recently on facebook of you know of things that i saw uh, you know the images that um, that look like me maybe when i was younger and bring you back into those memories right mm-hmm. to bring you back to those days of when you were young the days that you, you before you know time takes its toll on you and we're always caught up in those type of things and you know and sometimes you know they're for fun or you know it was a game it was a puzzle and to see what you know what different hairstyles and different things look like on you but but really the but the sinister thing and i'm not saying it was right or wrong i'm just saying we all want to put on a mask, right? We all want to put on a different face. We all some where we all don't really care something. There's always something about ourselves that we don't always like, right? We're always wanting to change. Cause we're so, you know, we're all we're so focused. We, you know, Satan keeps us, you know, focused on our identity, our weight, and you know, and and in our our life. You, as far as our, you know, our, our completion in life, does that make sense? Are we complete? Are we affirmed? Are we, are we, uh, are we validated in this life? Because when we, when you go through testings and trials and, and difficulties in life, you feel kind of like, you know, you feel, you know, hopelessness in, in life, right? You don't feel like you've accomplished. You haven't feel like you've, uh, fulfilled your purpose in life. You haven't fulfilled your destiny. You feel like you go through the problems. You're you're sorting out the trials of life, but you really never really came to your place that you feel like this is where I'm at in life. This is this is why I was born. This is why I was created. Right. Sometimes it takes time. It takes it takes long times. And we all and when you only see the problems of life and you see the disappointments or the shipwrecks of life, you kind of after a certain age, you kind of wonder where is your life going? Where have I fulfilled my uh, life destiny? Is is what God has planned for me came to pass, right? The, and those are always kind of the question marks of our thoughts because we want to we want to fulfill God's plan and will of our lives, right? And so makeup and cosmetics even in the uh indigenous people they would put war paint on right and they would become a different person right because they were under a mask they were under and it it was almost like with the even when uh we were in the uh, 2019 when covid first came out you know the mask and all the uh conspiracies about the mass and how the mass actually transitions you into a different person. Like when you go into a secret society or something, you are one person in the public, but behind doors, you wear a mask, right? You wear a, you're a different person. And that is almost like that spirit comes upon you, right? So when you can take it to those, I'm taking it to those degrees, those deep levels of, of understanding that when we, when we, when we take the things that enhances our beauty or uh, things that the cosmetics, the things that, that try, that we were hiding those little uh, flaws in our lives, we can take them to the extreme measures where, the lines are blur. Do you see what I mean? And where you can't even differentiate between male and female, where you don't can't see, you know, there's a different person behind the mask. It's it's a duality, right? A duality of personalities. This is why certain clothing, certain uh 
a certain uh, costumes and certain uh, things in life can transform you into a different human being. The, uh, what you may do on the outward, you uh, you know, you may dress modest on the outward in public, but sometimes behind closed doors, you change your uh, garments to more sensual garments, right? Become more provocative and you become more of an animalistic behaviors because you are transforming from the 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 net for what it was natural to something unnatural, right? And this is what uh, uh, garments, costumes, makeup. We just came out of Purim, and they all dress up during these times. They put on a mask, and so this is how witchcraft is used. It is it is changing you from one person to another person. So this is why. God says, you know, you know, take on my clothe, take upon my appearance, clothe yourself with righteousness and humility, clothe yourself with the purity of God. Does that make sense? And to seek after godliness and holiness and purity and and not that it's wrong to enhance yourself but in the way that is done in a modest apparel right mm -hmm. something that is not going to change your identity not going to change your personality see we're got to be we've got to be the same you know it, you know, behind closed doors as we are in public. Nothing should change. We should have we shouldn't have two extremes within us. See, it's that duality that God is trying to get out of us. He wants us to be the same, the same person all the time. And that could be you could go the other extreme too. It's we see it more on the most more provocative side where people are more uh, sensual behaviors and, and they wear uh, garments that insinuate those type of behaviors, right? But you also can take it to the extreme where you look so modest, you look so pure, you look so holy, you look so religious, you look like you're doing all the right things, but the Bible says you're naked and you're wretched. Do you see, just like the Lady of the Church was, they had a form of godliness, but they were wicked on the inside. They had a bitter heart. They did not have a transformed heart. They were not <laughs> reflecting the purity of God. See, so it, it could go both extremes. This is why when we do things, we need to, even out of fun, even out of just, you know, just being, just because we, just, you know, those things are there. We tried those things out. They're a little fun. But we can't allow these things to take over our life. We can't allow them to be an obsession. We don't can't allow them to, to change our character. We are still on the road of purity. We're on the road of righteousness. We're on the road of gentleness. We're on the road of goodness. We're on that road of being modest and holy, right? Not being conformed to the world, but be ye transformed for the renewing of our minds. We do not put on airs. We don't put on a mask. We don't live a duality, a dual life, right? We live a a a a one. We're on one trajectory, and that's a Christ image, and denying our flesh, denying right, and denying the self life. And, and so that the life of the spirit can reflect uh, in us. So it's funny how the witch hazel was used for medicinal use and cosmetics use. The uh, abstracts from the leaves, bark, and twigs of witch hazel have been used as an astringent to treat irritations of skin and inflammation Tissue for hundreds of years, Native American used the plant to treat common colds, eyes and liver conditions, and other illness. Early sellers also used the leaves to make tea for various and medicinal purposes. Today, witch hazel is used in the variety of products, including ointments, soaps, and lotion. So I'm not saying that we're not 
can't use the things of the earth to for medicinal uses. But it's interesting to know that people that are, that are in the, the homopathic uh, lifestyles tend to go into the realm of witchcraft and using herbs and, and the plants and, and all these uh, ointments to uh, to transform their lives. Does that make sense? But we also have the flip side of that when we have pharmacia, when we have pharmacies that are using synthetic drugs, right? And uh, to put into our system to mask the pains of our system instead of treating the body the way the Lord wants us to treat the body. And that is through... Uh, spiritual and good health, right? Spiritually and with good health and to put the right things in the body so that the body can, you know, have its ultimate, you know, perform its ultimate purpose in life and not to be sickly, sick, sickly or weak among us by using, uh, you know, the things of the world that could be diet, or that could be things that we ingest, the things that we partake of, sugar, you know, tobacco products, alcohols in excess. Doing all these things contribute to the damages of our, our body, right? Mm -hmm. So every, so we there's an extreme on everything. We need to be conscientious about our lifestyles, our health, what we partake in, what we eat, how we conduct our life. But, 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 the, but the main focus of life is our spiritual condition that should also reflect in our in our how we take care of our temples right and that we don't get into two extremes we don't go into the medical systems or do we go in and uh, seek uh, help homopathically when uh, it leads to witchcraft and that they put uh, and they make up potions and, and they do all these things to try to transform or to change your current circumstance or your depression or your or whatever it may be. Right. They have mood now they have mood potions in some of these essential oils. So anyways, there's just a lot. There's a lot that we have to rightly, uh, rightly divide to which what what is permissible and what's not permissible what god this is why we need the leading of the holy spirit because satan's plan is to use the things of the earth to bend you away from the things of god to get you focused on earthly things right to be sensual and demonic he wants you to mess with his stuff the things that he has dominate to be able to control you and to give uh, legal rights to demonic activity in your life, right? right? This is why we secure ourselves from those things. And we also don't need to be uh, on the side of thinking we're doing all the right things, right? Mm -hmm. That we're not subject to air, that we're not subject to to. Uh, the fleshly carnal ways but when we recognize these things that we we uh repent quickly we get them right and we change our direction right that's how we do it because we all are subject to these things we're all enticed by the things of the world there is so much in this world of babylon that is so enticing that appeals to the flesh that appeals to our psyche and appeals to our lack in life right uh, the, it, it appeals to the things that we feel like we need in our in our uh, in our flesh to be happy, right? Mm -hmm. But actually, all we need is Christ. Jesus must be our all in all, and He must be every our one hundred percent completion. Right. You know, you, you know, we should be satisfied with Him. So the name witch ha hazel also originates from the folk, uh, folk history. Natives and early settlers used the witch hazel to find source of water underground as they walked over the ground that they were surveying. So they would use these branches as a divination rod. 
and they would carry the fork or bent witch hazel branches, which was used as a divining rod. They would observe uh, if the branches twisted or dipped, and they believed signals that they had found water. The practice was called water witching and led to the plant common common name witch hazel. If you would like, uh, so anyway, so anyways, um, uh, the, and it goes into more other different, uh, like winter shrubs and these, these, um, so it, everything that is in, in goddess worship have to do with the earth, has to do with trees, has to do with branches. You got the mistletoe, you got the, the uh, fir tree or the fir tree, you've got that, you know, the Christmas tree, you've got the reefs, you've got, and all these things are symbolize the phallus or the vagina or the, it, it, it's, it's the connection between fertility of uh, 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 producing something outside of God. See the father is uh, Yeshua. He is the, the, you know, he is the father it says that in there. He's a, he is the mighty God, the uh, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, because he is our progenitor to a new race, right? A new race, a spiritual race that is making spirit beings conform to his image to be able to abide with him in heaven, right? To buy uh, in the kingdom of heaven. It has nothing to do with the earth, but the earth is, and what it what it constitute is all about reproduction, and it and it in it what it does it re, uh, it reverences the female or the womb, right? That gives life, just like Eve. The uh, Adam called her the Havav, which means the uh, the giver of all life, because of the womb. It's an incubation center for humanity to come everybody must pass through the womb right just like jonah had to pass through the belly of the well or the heart of the earth or the womb or the pit to be resurrected from death to life right he had to to become a transformed renewed holy spirit filled person he had to come from an from a a carnal man and be born again from the heart of the earth, the pit of the earth, right? Mm -hmm. From death unto life, resurrection power to be able to carry the presence of God. This is our direction. This is why Satan uses the things that God uses that, you know, to explain his kingdom. He uses the, the same things to uh, to divert our our minds off of the kingdom of God and put on the things of the earth. And we start worshiping the things of the earth. Right. And these are what pagans do. They worship the things of the earth because they want blessings. They want the here and now. They want they want the prosperity. They want the power that Satan offers in this life. They're not willing to wait for for the the life to come to be uh, uh, to be promoted or to elevate they're not waiting on the uh, the uh, the you know the patience that god t tells us to wait patiently for the 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 fruits right he says don't be weary in well doing endure to the end be patient in well doing right because we we will see the fruit of our labors. We will. We will see the outcomes because we have put our trust in him. And he's he's conforming us to his image so that he can give us the power from on high that can be demonstrated in the power in the earth. But it takes time because he's got to get out the old to be able to uh, to. Uh, birth the new right mm -hmm. the old must go this is why 40 is either way you either get into the new beginning of life the transition that god calls us to come out of sin into his marvelous life and, or you're going to be judged with the wicked this this is the 40 and you you see that all through scripture right you see 40 as a as, as a, a transitioning power or a testing of faith and if they do not 
if they do not succeed, if they do not succeed in that testing, then they then they're then they're going to be judged. Right. Just like the children of the uh, in the wilderness that wandered in the wilderness 40 years, they were tested in the wilderness and they were all judged because they wasn't compliant to the renewal of God, what God wanted them to learn in their testing. They were not being transformed. They were being hardened. See, you can be transformed in your testing or you can be hardened in your testing testing, and then, then you'll be, you know, accounted with the wicked, right? And be judged uh, now or later. So this is why witchcraft. So the juniper tree, which Elijah was under, was a, was a, was a, uh, was a tree. Let me go back and read that. Because every uh, the like just like Jonah, he was he was under a tree, right? He was under a tree, and he he fell under depression, and he was under a the a, they think it was like a desert tree, and it was kind of like a castor oil tree that I think I read somewhere, and uh, and then he had a worm that came and and ate it up, but he was under some oppression, he was under some bondage, right? He, he, he still was heavy, heavy because he felt the oppression, the oppression of this of this female dominance. Right. And so juniper means a bro a broom plant or a desert shrub constitute uh, uh, that blooms white flowers found in Syria or Arabia. The root word is ratan, which means to bind or to attach, or yoke to a pole. Yoke to a pole, right? <laughs> so the root word for the tree that Elijah was under, the juniper tree, which also the kind of constitutes all these uh, fruit-bearing trees, right? Means to yoke, to yoke or to, bind, to be bound or bind. You're bound to that. Just like we look at Samson. As an example, Samson was, uh, you know, he was, uh, you know, he was a warrior. He was anointed of God. He was a, a man uh, that had could not cut his hair. He was under a Nazarite vow, right? He was under a, and so he allowed his hair to grow long. No razor could touch it because it represents the vine. And I, I taught this before. When you have long hair, the Bible says a man who has long hair is a shame, right? But in reverse, if you have long hair, hair, if you have made a Nazarite vow and you have dedicated yourself to the Nazarite laws, then you are not to cut that hair because now you are going to take the reproach, the reproach of, of the gospel, the reproach of, of being under the... Uh, under the uh, under God, you know what I'm saying? Because the world hates the things of God, right? They hate the uh, the uh, the order of God. So you're going to be under the you're going to set yourself apart. It's a set apart to be a a prophet or a a person that is going to uh, to you're going to you're going to have to withstand those blows of the of being a, a reproach to the to those around you right you're going to be a stench you the bible says that you become a stench to those who do not believe right mm -hmm. so you become a reproach because you have dedicated you set yourself apart and now you're bearing the burden of being the the object for God's anointing, which will bring opposition, which will bring persecution, which will bring affliction, which will bring fiery darts. You will be under heavy reproach and persecution, right? Because you bear his anointing. Yeah. So 
that but the hair represents you know but the bible says that he is the branch and we are the vines and we are to be anyone that is not plugged into him will be cut off and thrown into the fire right so the the hair that represents in the nazarite vow means that you are you are taken and it goes with the sabbath rest of the lamb I connected with both with the Sabbath rest where you are to work six days and let the seventh day of your land rest. And what it does, it grows up briars and weeds and twigs and it's, it's not groomed, right? Not groomed. It's not been mowed. It's not been plowed. It's not been taken care of. It's got all kinds of uh, weeds and thistles and briars and and a lot of things that grow up in a land that's not been attended to, right? So you you're taking where you're not attending to the earthly things, but your attention is on spiritual things. So the outer countenance may may what well, be de de decreased or whatever, or the outer may not be uh, your priority does that make sense mm -hmm. because you're more looking on an inward perfection mm -hmm. and carrying the anointing of god so the outer becomes dim to that which is of the spiritual uh, necessities of life which is abstaining right abstaining from the pleasures of the world which samson did not he did not you know take heed to that vow, but he did not cut his hair because he understood that anointing was was part of his power, right? Right. And so he was, uh, and he he didn't have a choice in the matter. He was told this by birth, right? Mm -hmm. God birthed a warrior that was going to fulfill his promises. He was a hornet. And he act as a hornet against God's enemies and he fought against God's enemies. So God did not take a blind eye to his, uh, you know, to his, you know, his problems in the lust, in the lust thereof. He had a, the lust of the flesh and the problems that he had uh, defeating the carnal fleshly needs. Right. But he allowed, but the anointing that put him, he, 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 it went so far, right? It went so far until he became ensnared by Delilah, and he they and he would play a game with Delilah. Remember, and he she would bind him to you know to certain things because you know he said the binding of, of to these trees would disempower him, right? And so until he she finally got it out of him she wore him down to the point that she he finally confessed where the power came in and then that was the ultimate bondage see he was bound in the flesh right and she was showing this in the natural binding him trying to disempower him but when he was given over to her seduction what happened he became spiritually bound because they they end up cutting the locks of his hair and he lost the anointing. And when he got up, he realized the anointing was gone. Just like Adam, after he sinned and listened to his wife over believing God, he covered himself. He was shamed. And that anointing, that radiance, that vibrance, that inner power, that power from within, that power that kept him in that eternal spiritual state left him. The light the light became abated, right? Abated. So, and it, and it, and it withdrew itself and he lost his strength. He became weak. He became small. He became fragile. He became worthless, basically defeated. And this is exactly what Delilah did to he he had no strength to overcome those Philistines. He had no strength to overcome Delilah. He had no strength to overcome the Philistines. So this is why 
it took him going into prison. They took out his eyes. So he had no longer was he uh, looking on the car carnal anymore. He was not looking in, uh, in, in a, at a carnal perspective. He had to be blinded. And then God was able to, uh, to, uh, to uh, work with him innerly. And when God was working with him inwardly, his hair grew. And even though he was blind and he was in prison and still held captive, God used his death, his strength to be kill more Philistines in his death and in his lifetime because he got his eyes off the natural and he took a spiritual journey from within. And God was able to allow that anointing to, you know, to come over him. And he was able to recover those things that he lost. And so, and he went through that transition of being renewed and changed. And so, and so anyway, so the binding of Delilah, he lost his spiritual anointing. And so anyway, so the hair signifies uh, either shame in feminacies, it's a shame to wear your hair long. I spoke that before. A shame because it show it blurs the line from being male and female, and it's and it shows uh, it doesn't sh it shows uh, uh, it it shows that you're more conscientious on the outward appearance than you are on your spiritual. Uh, appearance or your 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 spiritual direction being obedient to God and in his scripture God does not want us to blur the lines right mm -hmm. so that it is a shame for a man to have a covering or or uh, to have long hair because it shows that you're are under the powers of this feminine uh, feminine goddess worship right? Mm -hmm. You have bowed to the the to the Babylonian system. You have bowed to to the uh, to the domination of the of, of the divine feminine, and those things will start to you know you start to walk out those things that you have bowed yourself to, right? right. So this is why it's a shame, and I'm not saying you could be in feminine man and not have long hair but long hair in the bible is showing this infeminacy that they have been captivated or captured by this uh, this female dominance right and they have bowed and this is why we have to look at the the this tree and and look at when we look at at another uh or characteristic of one who was captured and killed by a tree, we have to look at Absalom, right? Absalom was, and I'm just going to tell the story and then I'll read for the first, but when I, when we look at, you know, we're looking at, we're okay. When we, when we, let's, let's go back. Let's go. Let's, when we look at the word bird, and we're looking at the the uh, all every unclean bird. We have to understand where does that come from, and we know that the Holy Spirit is represented, uh, you know, in the form of a dove. So with with a uh, with that, we can say there's an opposite. There's a contrast to the dove. And when we look at the rebellion, because when we look at the rebellion, first the uh, rebellion that took place was before the flood, right? Mm -hmm. The before the flood, that uh, when the angels came down and um, and and mated with the women and made hybrids, right? And there was the mixing, and God had to destroy the earth, the whole earth, because of its wickedness and be, and the flood. And when we look, and I'm going to go there. When we look at that word. And we look at uh, at the flood because that that was a worldwide judgment of rebellion, which we're going to in the future see a worldwide judgment of rebellion, where rebellion had had taken its, uh, you know, taken its full 
course in the earth where God now has to judge it. See, we think that we're 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 there. We're we're thinking we're 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 at the apex. We're at the epitome of this judgment because there, how much more wickedness can it get? <laughs> you know what I mean? How much perversion it can it get? How much defiance it can it get? But before God judges, there's some things in Scripture that tell us that must take place before this judgment comes to its apex, right? Before God judge, it must, this rebellion in the face of God must come at, you know, must must come up before him in such a prominent manner, such a, where the whole earth, the Bible said, will I even find faith in the earth when he returns? There, the whole earth, is full of this rebellion. Do you see? The whole system is full of this rebellion. The the and the and the persecution of the church and anything that represents righteousness and holiness and of the Father of heaven is going to be eliminated. We forget that the Bible says that in the when they start to deliver you up for tribulation, then you will start to see, you will start to see the, the end time take its course because they're going to cut off the righteous. Do you see? They're going to cut and they're going to exterminate the righteous. The extermination of righteousness has not yet come to its apex. Before God judges, there must be an extermination of the righteous. Faith must be as scarce as fine gold, right? It, it, they, the Bible says it, during the time of Judges that the word of God was scarce. There was no righteousness in the land. There, there was no, uh, there was no uh, word of God relevant in the land. And, and, and people had forgot the ways of righteousness. And yes, we are there, but we're but there's still righteous voices still proclaiming righteousness and holiness in the land. So there is going to be a day where there will be no more righteous in the land. And when there is no righteousness in the land, then there will be a worldwide judgment. When it had when it has uh has risen to the heavens then God will judge it. Did he not? Mm-hmm. And it says in, in uh, Genesis, let's go to Genesis 8. And it says, 2 and 7. It says, And the fountains also of the deep and the windows of heavens were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters returned from all the earth continually, and the ends of the uh, 150 days of the waters were abated and the ark rested in the seventh month and on the seventh day of the month upon the mount of mountain of Ararat and the waters decreased continually until the 10th month in the 10th, 10th month means congregation means the congregation of the Lord, the 10th month where God is uh, establishing his righteousness back where he's establishing right ruling back. Before everything was wicked, everything was perverted, everything was uh, it was uh, a corrupt system or corrupt uh, all the way. Uh, the Bible says there, even their imaginations were on evil continuously. There was no there was no righteousness that he could draw from. Right on the first day of the month were the tops of the mountain seen, and it came to pass at the end of forty days. New beginning, new renewal, transition. Noah opened up the windows of the ark, which he had made, and he sent forth a raven, which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. So he did not send a dove out immediately, did he not? He sent out a raven, which is an unclean bird. And it says this in Leviticus 11, 13, and these ye shall regard as an abomination because abomination had succeeded to the highest degree 
all under heaven was there an abomination before him and the raven represents abomination represents wickedness represents the judgment that God, that Noah put forth the raven because if God was not finished with his judgment then the uh, the unclean bird would die in the judgment God has that which God had rejected right he rejected that this Babylonian system the system of the fallen angels right he, he rejects it and those birds those ravens unclean birds are a representative the owls the night creatures these things represent this uh, unclean, hateful bird, this feminist goddess worship that had overtaken the whole world, right? And so he sent forth the raven seeing if God's judgment had, had passed, right? Which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. And he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the soil of her foot, and she returned unto him into the ark. She went back where she came under the under Messiah, under Christ, right? So for the first bird went out, it was the, uh, the unclean bird. But the dove came out and came back, but the unclean bird did not. But the dove found no rest for his soul to feed, and she returned unto it into the ark which represents christ messiah his kingdom righteousness holiness purity peace for the waters were of the face of the whole earth but but put forth his hand and took her and pulled her in unto himself of the ark where we have safety right the dove knew that safety was in the ark knew that the peace of god the love of god the the, the holiness of god, god the dove is a clean bird right that represents the spirit of God must return into Christ, will lead you to Christ, point you to Christ and will abide in Christ and will glorify Christ. Right. No. And, and, and stay in connection with Messiah Christ Jesus. They are one and the same. Right. Right. But the unclean bird fled and did not return unto Christ. Right. right. Was outside of Christ. Did, did its own thing, went about doing its own thing, went back where it came from, from the, from the earth, from, from, the, from the powers of the earth, which is under the goddess worship, which is under the support uh, superiority of Eve, not Adam anymore, right? Under his rule, under her, under her dominance, under her coach. This is what, and I wrote in this book, uh, about the red heifer being this uh this representative of the goddess worship she's a heifer a, a young heifer do you see that mud that uh, that must be destroyed and yeshua jesus died in that place to destroy knock her out of her place so that he could rule and reign in preeminence over the goddess because everything under heaven is under the goddess worship the defined feminine right mm -hmm. and it must be burned up and it's it, it has to be destroyed before god will receive you but he you should did and on that place where the red heifer is uh, uh killed in an unclean unclean place that will destroy that purifies death right mm -hmm. because it is this goddess worship that is killing god's creation right. which is mankind his beloved creation. Yes. And he stayed yet another seven days. And again, he sent forth a dove out of the ark. And the dove came into him in the evening. And lo, in her month was the olive leaf pluck, which represents the olive branches, the olive tree, which is represents Yeshua's kingdom. So Noah knew that the waters were abated from off the earth. So... The dove represents Jesus' kingdom, represents peace, represents the uh, olive tree that stands before God, that represents the wild and the natural branches that are grafted in Messiah. He is that root, that, that tree we must come into. And we must 
we must renounce all other trees, right? right? So anyways, before I wanted to say that because of Absalom, Absalom was under a rebellious spirit and he was uh, he was trying to dethrone David. David was on on the run because of Absalom and Absalom. And I'm just going to tell the story because Absalom and uh, Absalom be, uh, means my father is peace. Isn't that interesting? You know, David was the um, he was the father, right? The the everlasting kingdom with the eternal kingdom of david and and he was the he was the father of our messiah right jesus so the one that would bring in the he was the promised seed and he was the the man after god's own heart but he failed in many areas in his life and he opened doors to the satanic right he opened door to this feminist goddess he opened the doors and because he opened the door the bible says that uh, that the sword never left his house. There was destruction because of his relationship with Bathsheba, right? Mm -hmm. There was there was consequences to his relationship with Bathsheba. God didn't just forgive his sin and say, "Okay, you, you, you got to pass." No, there was things that took place now and then that had destroyed the natural kingdom of of Israel. And because he went into Bathsheba and Absalom was the opposite. He was the, the, the dichotomy of his father because his father represented the uh, messianic, the kingdom of peace. And his name is Shalom, Abba Shalom. That's what it means. It means Abba, Father, Shalom, which peace. Uh, or wholeness or completeness or the messianic age of peace. And he became the dichotomy of that, of his fa father. Yeah. He became the resistor. He became the one that causes a revolt against David's kingdom of peace. He was the instrument that uh, was used. And because of his connection because of the household that David allowed, allowed the Felician people that uh, he was uh, come into his kingdom, there was compromise because of his relationship with Hiram, the king of Tyra, which represents the, the Satan himself. He and his connection with him brought in idolatrous worship into the land. And so because of David, David and Bathsheba, and, you know, I wrote this in this book right here about the, the, uh, the things that took place during, during the time of David and his relationship with, with uh, Bathsheba. And, and I'm just going to read. It says, because, you, because when Nathan presented the problem he said the sword would never leave your house and he from that point there was confusion discord and dissension in david's house right mm -hmm. he might have sought repentance he may have had gotten uh redeemed and uh, and and his sins may may have been washed clean and they were not accounted against him but that doesn't mean that his offsprings did not suffer the consequences to his own actions. And that grieved David more than if it, if the sin, if he would had had this, it bore his own sins. You know what I mean? If he, if he was the, the contributor and the, the one that was the object of the God's justice, right? He was the contributor of sin, and he and, he, and then he would have been the instrument of God's judgment, right? But it does in God's kingdom, it don't work like that. It's past, right? It's past from generation to generation. And so, not getting to the uh, I'm get I'm going to get a little bit into this book. Uh, Okay, it says it was no longer God as king as over Israel 
from the natural perspective. It was now David's kingdom. He became law, a law unto himself where he had diminished. See, the Bible says that he, he served as king in Hebron for seven years. I believe it was seven years and 33 years. Uh, so I think it's 33 years in Jerusalem. So it was, so he was like seven years in. So altogether he served as king for 40 years, right? 40 years did he serve as king before God took him. And so anyways, uh, 40 means judgment. Judgment came and so did, so did uh, 40 years also Solomon reign. And so anyways, uh, and we also can see that, uh, I'll, I'll probably get into that in a minute, about that 33. It's because it's interesting, about 33, he was, he served 33 years in Jerusalem. This, when he served 33 years, he, he acquired... Uh, he acquired a lot of wealth. He acquired a lot of land. He acquired a lot of uh, recognition, position. His his throne increased. He was building himself a house, so he had elevated in a, a, a above his brethren. Right? He multiplied himself with women, which the Torah tells us not to not increase in 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 those things that are going to cause you to. Uh, subjugate your brethren and elevate you above the brethren, right? Uh, there's equality in God's house. And so anyways, so these little fleshly things that took place in the 33 years of his reign in Jerusalem kind of just compromised him, weakened him, made him small, right? Made him small in spirit and his carnal man became in his position his and his wealth and all that became his identity god was no longer his identity he didn't need god anymore for that strength that he did when he was fighting the giants or taking territory or fighting and and, and warring with Saul he didn't need god's strength anymore he needed he, he felt like he already arrived. And so when we feel like we don't need God and we're depending on ourselves, then we, um, then we, we lose our focus. We lose our sight and we're depending on, on our own strength and capabilities, right? We're not no longer depending on God. See, it was in those troublesome times of his life where he drew near to God. Now, he had everything he wanted. God, you know, he achieved everything that he desired, everything that God promises came to pass. And now it was kind of a downfall for David, right? A downfall because not long he didn't like completely backslide. He still had affection for God, but there was he made bad choices, right? That he would not have probably made choices when he was in his earlier years, when he was fighting the enemies of God. And it says, uh, it was no longer God as king over Israel from the natural perspective. It was now David's kingdom. He became a law unto himself. He perceived that he was great. He didn't follow God's instruction for a righteous king, even though David thought he was serving God with a pure intention. He elevated his status on the external things. God was with him in the defeats of his enemies and the prosperity of the kingdom of Israel. This showed that the best of man's intentions fell before, the per before a perfect God. Men exhaust themselves by viewing natural circumstances as approval from God. Scripture says to examine yourself whether you be in the faith, 2 Corinthians 13 and 5. The only evaluation a believer has to examine the intents of the heart and motives through Scripture and the con uh, conviction of the Spirit. It's evident that David was not in Scripture. The alliance with Hiram yoked himself with Satan. Satan is all about self-exaltation. See, you have before you can get to Absalom's story 
and and his insurrection and his rebellion, you first have to understand what happened to his father, right? Because what his father represented was the messianic kingdom of peace, the Melchizedek order, and and the righteous ruling of God. And because of his compromise and his breach with Bathsheba compromised his whole household, right? So Ezekiel 28, 12, 50, son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyre and say unto him, thus says the Lord God, thou seal up the sun full of wisdom and per, uh, perfect beauty. Thou has been in the Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stones was thy covering, thy, thy sardas, the topaz and the diamond, the burl and the oxen and the jasper, the sapphire and the emerald and the carabom the gold and the workmanship of thy taverns and thy pipers were was prepared in thee in the days that thou were created thou art the anointed messiah messiah cherub that covereth anointed cherub and has set thee so thou was upon the mountain of god thou walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou created till iniquity was found in thee. In the strong concordance, concordance sorry, Tyrus means Tasor, means Tyre, Tyrus, or a rock, the Felician city on the, on the Mediterranean coast. The serpent had been the anointed cherub, and he wanted to go back to the Garden of Eden. He is relentless to make sure his anointed position is not filled. He will stop at nothing to detour, distract, and destroy any one of God's seeds so they cannot inherit it. Satan used the coast of the sea to traffic or merchandise the people to solicit false worship. The Felician god Molech, Molchar, required child sacrifice and rituals for this. The God, uh, the God of Moloch promised prosperity, which is Satan's way to snare the masses for world dominance. The same goes on today. Satan disguised himself, made himself look like he could benefit David. He made inroads into David's kingdom by joining in the building his house. The scripture says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. We are not to be unequally yoked with darkness. Hiram worships Satan in the form of Molech. So why is a why is he a friend of David, a righteous seed? The two cannot have fellowship. It will infect the righteous little by little until the righteous is destroyed. Thank God for Uzziah or Uzziah or Perizuza, the place of the breach didn't dying so that the new order could be established. Second Samuel 11, 1, 5. And it came to pass after the years was expired at the time when David got, uh, go forth to battle that David sent Joheb and his servant with him and all of Israel and they destroyed the children of Ammon uh, and besieged Rabbath, and David tarried until still at Jerusalem, and it came to pass at eventide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of his king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and what and one said, is not this Bathsheba, means uh, daughter of the oath, of the inheritance, the daughter of, of, of that oath that was given in Genesis 3, that the seed, of the, uh, the seed of the woman would crush the head of the seed of the serpent. But the seed of the woman is, is the Messiah would come and crush that head. Not, but what is Satan? You, he has elevated the womb, not the seed, right? Mm -hmm. The seed is what is to be elevated. Messiah Yeshua that will crush the head of the serpent, not the womb where it came from, right? right? And so this is where Bathsheba is that womb 
that Satan is trying to get David to uh, bow to, right? Bow to that womb mm -hmm. where he will be crushed instead of him crushing that serpent's head. The daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite, and David sent messengers and took her and she came and came in unto her and he laid with her for she was purified from her uncleanness and she returned unto her house and the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. So David was supposed to be in battle, but he stayed behind in Jerusalem. When you are not engaged in warfare, in the battles with God, fighting against his enemies, when you, be, when you fraternize with the enemy, when you become friends with the enemy, when you join with the enemy, when you partner with the enemy, when you become equally yoked with the enemy, the yoke is going to t take you to the path of unrighteousness mm -hmm. because your flesh cannot overcome the powers of darkness. That's why you must separate yourself, come out, be separate and, and not join the way that, that they join and do the things that they do. <laughs> come out from among them and be ye separate, <laughs> says the Lord. Second Timothy 2, 4, no man that was entangled himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. So in the Strong's Concord in the evening tide, the word evening tide means, uh, means ereb, means dusk or night or sunset. Uh, the bed chambers means a, a carnal intercourse or a couch. And the first, the law first mention takes you to the father's bed, which the, do not defile the father's bed. Uh, to walk means halak which means uh, to wander or wander away. The roof is gag. A roof is by the top of the altar. In Exodus 30, the top of the altar. So the roof was not an actual roof. She was, at, she was on an altar. She was under a feminist altar. Strong concordance means house, um, means a courtyard or daughter or door. And washing means bathe. Uh, it means wash self. So these words, these terms have a, I'm not going to break them down. Second Samuel said, Absalom took a tent upon the top of the house, the law first mentioned, went into his father's concubines in the sight of Israel. So he did the same, very, very same thing. He took, went on the roof or went on an altar and he took the women that were assigned to and joined with David, his concubines, and defiled him. And the Bible says that when David returned after Absalom's death, these women could not, they, they, lost their, they lost their function in life. They were no longer David's wives. And they just, they were isolated and set, uh, set away from until they passed away. So they lost their purpose. They lost their destiny. They lost their uh, vitality because the enemy came in, not unaware, not by their uh, condolences, but came and corrupted David's house. And corrupted his women and this rebellion or dominance, dominion, taking a dominance over the kingdom was the heart of it, which God that, you know, took them out of use, took the women that were that belonged to David out of function or out of use. And that can say a lot. That's what the enemy does. He he takes he de comes in, distorts, perverts, and defiles, and 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 corrupts you so he can take you out of your you out of use. You become a corrupt vessel, right? Mm -hmm. Not designated for purpose anymore. Not designated to bring forth life anymore, spiritual life. So the top is the same word for gag, which means roof or top of the altar. Absalom went out on top of the altar in the sight of Israel. In the sight means uh, eye or fountain. So all of Israel saw this, this perversion, this corruption, this, this, this defiled, um, perverted sex act uh, was on display 
in the courts of the of of the middle of the city, right? Where everybody could view view this. I believe in the passage, David rose from the bed of carnality. He was blinded by darkness and went away as a wayfaring man to an altar of King Moloch, saw a woman, the daughters of the land, and from that altar was drawn like a fountain to this very beautiful, seductive woman who was bathing. So David, because he was not engaged uh, in warfare, he was not engaged and connected with the uh, with his with the King of Kings and the Lord of Wars. He was not. He had backslidden to his carnality, his desires, his needs. He wants. He had. He had arrived. So he had no need for God anymore. He didn't need him because he wasn't warring anymore. So why do I need God? I'm. I'm happy. I'm content. I'm. I'm full of life. I have everything at my disposal. Why do I need God? And even though he didn't leave God mentally, his flesh said otherwise, right? And because he was not, he was not engaged in the things of God and God's purpose and plan, uh, he was um, he was used of the enemy through the flesh to be infiltrated by the enemy, right? Yeah. And so. And so the all uh, says the and so that the beauty of this woman, the woman that was uh, in the middle of the city that was offering worship unto Balaam, because she was a, she w- was a daughter of the land. She was she purposely and intended for David to see her. Right? Mm-hmm. She would intended this thing to happen, and she put, presented herself in a way that he would see her. And it was like an altar to Bo, uh, Molak or to Baal. And from that altar was drawn like a fountain. He That seduction drew him like a fountain. And David was seduced by the ritual of bathing. David sent for and received her and received her and her king. When he joined with her, he received not only her, but all that she worshipped, right? He bowed to the king of the seductive woman, which is Satan. This is exactly the 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 mo of, of of Satan. They were joined in bed of fornication, and David became one of one with a harlot. The Bible says that you for you you sin against the body. You become if you join with a harlot, you become a harlot or whoremonger, right? right. And David became one with a harlot. Bathsheba was being purified was being purified in a ritual or mikvah in a ritual bath in the time after her uncleanness, her nidah, her menstrual period. So she was bathing after her menstruation, which is the time of uncleanness, which is not permitted for, mikvahs are not permitted for women in Jewish tradition. Tradition of mikvah for women was an old tradition it was not ordained by God. It was a tradition. Let me get that straight. It was a mikvah was traditionally uh, brought in by the Judaism, but it was not ordained in scripture, right? It was added to their traditions and rituals. Mikvahs were used only for men's purifications because men were the only ones allowed in the sanctuary or at the gate or at the courtyard of the tabernacle. The instructions for mikvah, okay, so the tradition of mikvah for women was an old tradition in Judaism, Judaism, not a requirement for women in the law of Moses. The instruction for mikvah is for males who were going to the temple to bathe themselves from certain uncleanness with with a mikvah that required natural flowering water. A woman was unclean for separation. For seven days during her time of need off. Then the eighth day she was to take a sacrifice to the priest to offer up for her. The tradition for mikvahs with immersion for women purification was not instructed by God. It was added according to various sources. It's still unknown when the practice began. The requirement for a woman to be mikvah was found in Jewish commentaries and rabbinical writings. 
The mikvah, by definition, was designed to provide bathing facilities that remained in contact with natural sources of water. It was to contain a certain amount of water for immersion, for ritual, ceremonial purifications, the purpose for males defined in Torah's instructions was to focus on man's mind on pure on ritual purity, but it somehow became a, in Judaism a female ritual focusing on sexual availability and marriage. It is, in my opinion, in the above scripture that the woman bathing is being mikvah as a ritual purification in a public arena where David saw her. It wasn't a private or at an intimate setting. David immediately lusted for her. The word took her came can also mean in the Strong's to mingle. I believe that this was a seduction of the unseen forces operated, operating her. The attraction was without thought to her current status of marriage. David proceeded with hot pursuit to follow her. The word sin means pursued or inquire means to seek. The desire that David had within his, within had implications of worshiping her. He bowed to her. The traditions of the bath symbolize the cleansing of sin like baptism in Christianity. It is a symbol of death. The water in the pagan world is received as a source of life. Rain has been on the forefront of mankind's desire for prosperity, crops, source of life throughout antiquity. In the Illuminati watchers and other sources state, according to ancient rituals of iniquity, of antiquity, I'm sorry, of Molech, the horned deity, Baphomet, is worship for the purpose of providing rain. The sacrifice of infants is for the purpose of of providing rain for the uh, followers since rain was a necessary to water crops and sustain life. It was the ancient civil water was living water in ritual baths of purification in the near, near Eastern religion. The water had to be, had to be running uh, or form natural resources. The symbol for water is the inverted triangle and which looks like a vagina and has magical uh magic apprehended uh, magic apprehended to it the or sorcery or witchcraft the kingdom of darkness seduced david to join himself to idolatry or adultery as a means to, to get uh, a goal to corrupt messiah's lineage david's transgression would have mixed with the eternal kingdom by default and given the uh, uh, opportunity for Satan to usurp the title deed to heaven's earth, a position given to the Mel Melchi Sedic king only. David gave his worship to Bathsheba that desire for her to replace his desire to obey God, just like Adam desired, to, desired Eve over obeying God. She stood as an idol. He worshiped in place of worshiping God. Bathsheba caused David to lust for forbidden fruit. The object of David's worship became her female body and the idol took him further into sin and away from God. The act of worshiping God is to keep man from being deceived into re redirecting his worship to self or lust. This is the nature of Satan. Satan sits in the seat of self. The prophet Nathan decreed a sword by God to raise up an enemy, an unseen force that will separate his wife, house of Israel, from God to another husband, Satan. From the east to the west, it will be done in the face of pagan sun worship, the world. The nation of the world will see the destruction that will, was exalted from the Solomon's time until the captivity of the northern kingdom by Assyrian sun worshipers and the captivity of the southern kingdom, Babylon southern worship so the war the sword never left his house so we see that it, through david's worship to bathsheba became an avenue for his, the destruction of his household and when we look at 
at uh, Samuel, 2 Samuel 18, we see that Absalom's death, he had long hair, which was, he was, the Bible says he was a beautiful, handsome man. And he, it also says that he, uh, he, he attracted the, uh, the, uh, the people, the people were fond of him. He, uh, he drew, uh, drew a lot of attention to himself. So he was nice looking, handsome, and his appearance was, outward appearance was more, uh, more, uh, more, more prevalent than his inward responsibility of being loyal to his own dad, to his own father, his, his own heritage. And the Bible says that his hair grew because he was infeminate. He was, he was small in the spirit. He, he, and outwardly he was emotional. Outwardly he was uh, 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 working in witchcraft to manipulate the people by seduction. Outwardly he was manipulating the people by his charismatic uh, 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 personality. Outwardly he was manipulating, intimidating the people by his outward countenance of being looking and peering to be strong as a warrior but inwardly he was without god and made him infeminate and small right little so he he uses his uh his his carnal man to dominate the people and bring them into bondage and he caused an insurrection he after he uh, destroyed Ad Ajajah by uh, causing his death to and uh, to be he didn't himself kill him but caused his death after raping his uh blood sister his natural sister they, they see this is what happens when you have a blended family you have more than one wife the the children strive amongst each other do they not and they war against each other and so there was a, an alliance and a loyalty between Absalom and his uh and his sister and when abijah the other uh son of david from another wife uh was the bible says that he was uh, drawn to absalom's sister and he loved her and he desired her and he uh, tricked her into coming uh, and and uh, meeting his needs because he said he was sick and when he got her into a place of vulnerability, he took advantage of her. And the Bible says that he, that love that he had for her, the same love and desire he had for her, he hated her at the same time. That love that in the, once he got her, once he defiled her, once he uh, treated her like a whore, it reversed into hate. He hated her and he wanted to destroy her and wanted to kill her. And Absalom defended her and ca and caused a, a, a situation where he would uh, uh, dominate the situation and and cause his death. And this grieved uh, David. This grieved him uh, and vexed him because David did not take action against what Abijah did, and he was grieved that his son died and that Absalom took took vengeance against the, uh, uh, against him. You know, on behalf of his sister. And so, but you can see when, when lust is at the root, when there's infimity at the root, when there's feminine goddess worship, when the infiltration comes in, there is no more love. It's just hate. There is no respect. There is no more honor. The Bible says, the Bible says in the last day that the, that the, uh, that the, uh, Sodomite or the beast will hate the whore and she and he will destroy the whore because ultimately that sodomite selfish hatred spirit that was overcome by lust will destroy the object of lust right mm -hmm. and that's exactly what happened and he destroyed he hated her he because he treated her like a whore after she was pure she was first she pleaded with him not to do it he did it and then he hated that love that no longer existed for her right and so this is why absalom went to, he went to Hebron and he uh started 
to acquire uh, the affection and the attention of the people. And he started to be lifted up in his own mind above his own father. And then he caused an insurrection against his own father. But the text of it is that we know this happened because the infiltration of the Moloch and uh, goddess worship, Astaroth and Bala and Astaroth and Moloch, all became a part of Israel, the kingdom of God, the set apart kingdom of God became inundated with Baal worship, right? Mm -hmm. With goddess worship. And so anyways, there was no more honor. There was no more respect for his father, his father of peace anymore, the fa his father, David, or his forefather. And the Bible says in Second Corinthians, uh, 2 Samuel, this is, I'm going to end on this, 18 and 4, I mean, 18 and 10, it says. And a certain man saw it. I said, listen, and let's go up. It uh, says, for the battle was there scattered over the face of all the country. And there was a great war between uh, David's men and Absalom's men. And the woods, de uh, the woods devoured more people that day then the uh sword devour and absalom met the servant of david and absalom rode upon a mule small and and distorted a mule is a, a is, is is something that you genetically have to mix right a uh, i think it's a horse and a a donkey or something but a mule is a, is a hybrid it's like is a hybrid of two species Went under the thick boughs of the great oak. Well, that word oak, it means it's not like a, a an oak tree, but that word actually it, it is a uh, let me look it up. It means it's a turpentine tree. It was a long. It's, it means a turpentine or turpentine tree. Uh, it, it was a it was a long branch tree. It was it wasn't like this big oak tree that stood. No, this was a draping tree, like the and it and it was a tree that looked and similar to what Jonah was under, and the same tree that was that Elijah was under. I'm feeling those oppression, feeling that bondage, and. The Bible says that, that, see, that the hair, the countenance, that personality, the, the outer countenance became a snare unto Absalom. Do you see what I mean? And the Bible says that his hair got caught in this turpentine tree. Which is mean a feminine tree, right? Mm -hmm. Not an oak tree that represents masculinity, but an feminine tree. His hair got caught in the branches of it, and he was caught. He was yoked. He was bound up. He could not free himself. Do you see what I mean? He went too far. He was under the powers of darkness, and he was uh, and he had he had he took his rebellion too far, right? And, and now he was trapped and could not get away. And the Bible says, and uh, and he and he was taken up between the heavens and the earth, and the mule that was under him went away. And a certain man saw it, and told Joab, and said, "Behold, I saw Absalom hanging in the oak or the turpentine tree." And Joab said unto the man that took told him, and said, "Behold, thou sawest him, and why him? And behold, thou sawest him, and why didst thou not smite him there?" to the ground and I would have given thee 10 shekels of the silver. And the man said to Joab, I thought should receive a thousand shekels of silver in my hand. Yet would I not put forth my hand against the king's son for in our hearing, the king's charge thee and, and uh, saying, behold, that none touch the young man Absalom. Otherwise I should have wrought falsehood against my own life. For there is no matter hid from the king, and thou thyself wouldest have set thyself against me. And then said Joah, I may not tarry thus with thee. And he took the three darts in his hand and thrust them from his heart 
thrust them through the heart of Absalom while yet he was alive in the midst of the oak. So he was bound up and then then the then he was destroyed by one of the men of David. And the young man that bare Joab armor compassed about and smote Aslan and slew him. So that very thing that uh, that David let in actually destroyed his whole family and destroyed his own son, destroyed his relationship. That oak is a, a, a feminine noun, which is tur- turpentine, means that he, what he should have been living in peace, he had no peace. He was no, he was under the he was under the guise of witchcraft and whoredom, and under that spirit, just like when Jehu saw the mother, uh, the son of Jezebel, he said, "There will be no peace until your mother Jezebel's whoredom and witchcraft ceases." Do you see? Until it is an end. This is why the Bible says, do not suffer a witch to live means do not allow their fiery darts. Do not let their witchcraft practices, do not let their seduction, do not let them dominate, intimidate, or uh, or, or manipulate you. Destroy the works of witchcraft. We are under an obligation and responsibility to destroy all forms of witchcraft, right? Yeah. And and its involvement. And that third degree, that third, when he was, I want to make this, I was reading in the article, uh, it says the the serpent of wisdom in the, in the about that 33, because 33 is the key that unlocks the 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 god self in the occult realm right wow. it unlocks that self self lusting spirit that brings you to an, an epitome of god of in your mind of a godlike status right and that you it's the 33 degrees so you're going up 33 degrees in freemasonry that is achieving this self uh this self uh, epitome, right? Where you are a God and you're no longer under a God. It says the 33 degree in the ancients accepted in the Scottish rites of Freemasonry. It is not irrelevant or to say, or significantly stated yet without much pomp, uh, pomp, uh, pomp, pompicity that the 33 degree of occult masonry esoterically corresponds with the 33 spiral vertebrae saying says samuel on um, wars in the three mountains the 33 degree represents the human head or the top remember i wrote the top where the top of the altar uh-huh. satanic altars the top the 33 vertebrae which is the illumination of the of the, of the uh, conscious mind to bring in this witchcraft spirit uh, vertebrae of the back saying this saying uh, says Jim Mars in his last book before he was murdered. The Illuminati, the secret societies that hijack the world, the fiery Kundalini serpent. This is why the, I read that scripture about God would not give you a serpent, but He gives you the Holy Spirit to work and operate in the realm of the spirit. But they work in the opening of this uh, third eye of the Kundalini serpent that coils up the uh, the spine. And these uh, uh, these are emulations, right? Mm-hmm. Occul- uh, that they believe they're rising to higher consciousness. The fiery kundalini ser- serpent is coiled three and a half times at the base of the spine. It is said to awaken and rise the spinal cord through through union of a plurality, which is uh, the opposite or duality. So by their debased, deprived nature, they're beginning they're gaining power in their rebellion against God, and they're ga- gaining satanic power. And they're outside of the plan of God, right? Outside yeah. the 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 spiritual laws that He has ordained, and they will pay the the ultimate consequences, which is death. 
when the kundalini goes up the spine to the crown chakra, one is said to achieve physical and spiritual immorality. Uh, is a apotheosis, which is becoming a god or god realization. Thirty-three is the number of the highest spiritual attainment possible, according to Elizabeth Van Buren. It may it may contention that the reason for this because when the kundalini goes up all 33 vertebrae of the dev- of the spine one achieves apotheosis jesus christ was crucified at the age of 33 which i don't necessarily believe but 30 in thir- 3 in uh in biblical terms means resurrection right and 3 upon itself do you see but in the satanic realm it is it, it, it has a lot of nasty connotations to it. it has a lot of a lot of things that it represents and i'm not going to get in today but i believe that was inserted i don't believe there that he was i think that was inserted by the freemasons actually i don't think 30 i don't think even though jesus is god i don't think he achieved it i believe this is what they want to believe, right? That he t- achieved God's status. This is why the Bible says that is antichrist. That is antichrist. It says Jesus Christ was God and he came in and dwelled in flesh, God with us. When you think the opposite of that, that's antichrist. If you think that Jesus was human and he attained Godhood status and he achieved Godhood, then you are antichrist. You are the opposite to the what the Bible has revealed and concerning the deity of Messiah. Jesus was God from the beginning, and he was God until the end. And he, it was Christ came and manifest manifest himself in flesh, not the opposite, right? Anyone who believes that Jesus that that it, he does not believe that Jesus dwelt in the flesh, God with us, then the uh, then you are antichrist. The Bible says because most occultists believe that you can become flesh and achieve godhood, which is the opposite of 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 Christ. Right? He was God. He didn't have to achieve godhood. He was God. He was the the Word made flesh. Right? The 33 vertebrae is named the Atlas vertebrae. In Greek mythology, Atlas holds up the whole earth on its shoulder. The Atlas vertebrae holds up the skull. The first three letters of Atlas is alt. A is the first letter. T is the 20th, uh, 20th letter. And L is the 12th letter. 1, 20, 12 is 33. Alt, A. TL is the abbreviation for Atlanta or Atlanta. Atlanta is on the 33 parallel. And then they say Jesus also resurrected and ascended to heaven when he was 33 years of age. My contention is that this is a metaphor for the Kundalini going up the 33 vertebrae of the spine and through the crown chakras at the top of the skull. So this is, they put that in there because they want you to believe that he obtained Godhood, that he wasn't God himself, right? Uh, 33 is the devil's number, the pathogen numerology. When Satan fell from heaven, he took a third of the angel, which is 33%. And they landed on Mount Hermon on the 33, 33rd parallel. And then we go into uh, uh, the the ninth Hebrew letter of Teth and symbolized the serpent. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, emphasis called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast into the earth and his angels were cast with him in Revelation 12, 9. uh, It was 10th is the synonymous with Seth, which is Satan, and the name of Satan in ancient Egypt. The word Satan comes from Set N, constructed on the Twin Towers, began in 1968, 33 years before 9-11. And I'm going to skip all of the conspiracy stuff. But anyways, it's interesting to know 
that the occultist uses the 33, which David was, it was 33, means they using uh, this self, the power of flesh and the powers of darkness conjoined with that to be able to come into a epitome, do you see, of, of, of worship to be like unto God. And when David, I think there were, there were 33, David repented, right? And he, he, I believe he went to heaven. I believe he, he was not. But they use that term 33 because they, the occultists, want to usurp this power and authority that was given by God, the Melchizedek king, priest, authority that rules both heaven and earth. And they're trying to do, they're going about a different way to do it. See, because David was the eternal kingdom of God, that this serpent is trying to infiltrate, right? And he reigned 40 years and Solomon reigned 40 years because it became the war of the flesh, the eternal and the carnal, the flesh and the spirit. Do you see the difference? And because we work and operate in the flesh, when we work and operate in the flesh, then we have then we will be judged in accordance to the flesh. And that and that doesn't just end with us, but that can also end with our generations, right? So on that, I feel like you know it was interesting to me to use Aslan as a, an example of how this infiltration of bell worship and this compromise of David was under his power and he what he was captured and hung on the same thing that David his father was hung on spiritually right that he literally hung on a tree a feminine tree and was destroyed but spiritually David was hung by the, the the seduction of a witch that was under a feminist goddess worship, right? And that is why, and and he lost his power. He was weakened. He lost his anointing. Do you see what I mean? And his power to rule because flesh cannot, can, cannot please God. It will always fail. Do you see? It will always fail. This is why we must we must never lose our place in God, never our dependency on him. We need this is why Yeshua came and died on the cross to break the yoke of the power of the feminist goddess. And then on that and when we look at the raven, I'm gonna, just as I brought this up, the raven, there's a family. The Bible said it was a family of ravens which includes, you know, crows and uh, all kinds of different species uh, of, of birds that we see symbolically in, in, in the mythology and in the satanic worship. And this is why the, in the crows, uh, I'm trying to look at some of the, they are, uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, crows, ravens, rooks, magpies, jackdaws, jays, trippies, uh, choths, and nutcrackers. And a lot of these things are, are in the pagan, uh, in pagan rituals and pagan and in pagans uh, artwork and pagans uh, depictions of life. And these, this is why the Bible says these are an abomination because they represent wickedness, right? And this is this is why we uh, we are to flee from these things. And on that, I'm going to end.